Um, yeah, so in the next uh, two sessions, we really want to start about the mass spec basics and define like that data frame we're looking at. And I think like for like all the tools we, we showcase the rest of the, of the summer school, this is really important. So yeah, if there's any questions or doubts afterwards, like please ask, there, there's no uh, bad questions. Um, so yeah, let's, let's make sure that we uh, are all on the same page of like LCMS MS um, data dependent acquisition, because that's what we, we heavily using. So yeah, just to start very basic mass spectrometry, it's just like measuring masses. And I, I find that like very intuitive. The only little bit complicated thing is that it's measuring masses of charged um, like molecules or ions. So we measure M over Z. Okay, that's already a little bit more complicated. So if you hear about that the first time, you really have to keep that in mind because for like some, especially larger molecules, that's a, a really important thing if we look at the, at the data. But yeah, besides that, it's just like a balance, very precise, and you can like measure those um, charged molecules and then determine their mass very precisely, so precisely that we can like calculate based on the mass defect of like the different atoms, um, such things like molecular formula. That's, I think, very powerful. I think Martin uh, made heavy uh, use of that. Most metabolomics tools with high-res data uh, make use of that. And then we already like shed some light on like the chemical identities of like, I don't know, like this huge chemical space. So yeah, I think this is um, pretty exciting. And uh, well, then looking at like the machines, uh, who of you has not seen a mass spec in real life? Most of you. So yeah, it's like this bigger boxes with like a lot of like complex things. And I think meanwhile, it's mainly a big computer with like some vacuum uh, chambers and like a mass analyzer. But yeah, like we have like this concept, you know, if like you have an inlet, you need to like ionize your, your molecules and then the ion source typically, and then you like analyze their mass. And eventually that contains also like a separate detector depending on like the type of mass spec. And because we're like manipulating like this ions flying around, like air kind of like disturbs us. So we like pump it out and have this typically under high vacuum. And then, yeah, as I mentioned, the electronics is it's really like an essential part. And when you like look into like a, like an QX active or so, you'll see that there's mainly boards uh, you will see inside of the box. And then, yeah, obviously the, the computer at the uh, downstream end, which we need to like not only acquire the data, but also to um, analyze it. And yeah, starting with like ionization, I find this really um, exciting to, to like kind of like define chemical space first and then maybe be a little bit aware of like the biases uh, Martin already mentioned. And yeah, what I, what I did here in this plot, I was simply plotting like the uh, molecular weight of like uh, 1 million compounds from like different bio databases, which uh, I got kindly provided by, by Kai Dürkop, who you will uh, also meet this week. Um, and I plotted those uh, masses versus the um, calculated uh, log p value. So this is basically like the polarity. So it comes from like traditional um, chemical properties, the partitioning between an, uh, an octanol and a, and a water phase. But it kind of like, um, yes, yeah, very um, much correlating with retention time over like a reversed phase um, chromatography column. So it tells you basically how polar or how well dissolvable in, in water this molecule is. And yeah, it's pretty interesting to, to, to look at this like chemical space of this 1 million compounds. And I hope that this is maybe somehow representative of, of what we may find in nature or in our systems we're working with. And now there is, I think an important thing to be aware of that is that like different areas of like this chemical space will be covered differently well by the different ionization techniques there are, right? And there is, as Martin said, not uh, a one fits all solution, right? So we're kind of like looking at different um, areas of like this uh, molecular space, depending on size and polarity is kind of like main, main driving physiochemical uh, features. And yeah, so again, this is uh, yeah, like an overview. There's like different techniques. So depending on the molecules you may be interested in, you may need to use um, one of them. So yeah, today, I think uh, besides like looking at all of those in detail and, and I don't know, explaining like the advantages and disadvantages, we only wanna like focus on 
one, and this is electrospray ionization. Um, just so you know, there's other stuff. If you want to do GCMS, then you're probably going to use electron impact. Um, so yeah, we're going to look at um, electrospray today. And that is because this is the most commonly used ionization technique for LC MSMS, which I think is kind of like the uh, data um, and technique most of us uh, are working with. Um, yeah, so, okay, who's, who's using ESI, electrospray ionization? If you, okay. Who's not using ESI, but something else? Do I see a finger? No, no, nobody. I'm sure like at least like as a um, kind of like alternative approach. So GCMS would be, I guess, a, a very common thing. Then you have electron impact or chemical ionization. Um, they're also really important, but I think for the sake of, of time, we will focus on LCMS today. So yeah, what you have there, let's see if I can get this running, is, is a like pretty cool like principle, uh, which uh, uh, Fenn and others uh, got eventually the Nobel Prize for. And yeah, that is, sorry, the video doesn't work. Um, anyway, so yeah, we basically have like this cool thing that we, when we have a needle and we put like a potential on it and we pump like a little liquid through it, then uh, we get like this very tiny droplets, right? And that uh, in that video, you would have seen that like when I turn like the, the potential on and off, like that electro spray effect kind of like dies off, right? So. Yeah, there might be other physical concepts like also be at work, but like uh, I think the trick is that you like put like here this uh, potential between like the needle tip and like the inlet, and then you have like this electro spray effect. So now if you use larger um, flow rates, then you also have typically like some some type of like um, uh, gas nebulizer gas that helps you like evaporate then like this tiny droplets. But the idea is that like at the end you have droplets so small that like either um, ions like um, uh, basically, um, yeah, like expel each other um, to kind of like may, um, result like in, in, in single um, ions or you have like a, an ion evaporation. So there are two models basically um, considered for like this ESI effect. But yeah, what is most important is that at the end there is like, yeah, single um, like ions here left and they, then uh, through again, like a potential get sucked into like the mass spec inlet. So that's basically what's happening in your source. And then you have ions and then you can uh, start manipulating them. And yeah, coming back to our initial um, uh, chart with like the polarity, which kind of like is kind of dictated by like the structure and perhaps by like the content of like heteroatoms. There is a lot of um, things that might not ion. Right, so that depends on where we are in chemical space. And here are just like um, a couple of examples of things that probably um, ionize very well and others that may ionize less well, right? And that is strongly uh, correlated like to uh, like the acidity or basicity um, of like the compounds. And it also dictates what kind of modes you wanna use, right? So like you may have heard that there's like um, ESI positive mode and ESI negative mode. So depending on which way you like um, put that potential in, you will like cr uh, create like cations or anions of, of your molecules, right? So, and this really like depends on the structure, how good that will work. So now think about um, like here, uh, an acid at the, at the top, a carboxylic acid, like most classical um, functional group. Uh, who of you think that this will work very well in, in positive mode? Who, who of you think it will work very well in negative mode? Okay. Why? Because it's like easy to take away a proton, right? So then you have like the um, um, anion of like the carboxylic acid, whereas like the proton affinity of this carboxylic acid is, is probably pretty bad. Hence, if you're like interested in poorly fluorinated like um, uh, carboxylic acids, you know, negative mode might be the thing you, you want to use, not positive mode. So there again, like the you know, analysis you do kind of um, dictates a little bit like what chemical space you come in. Now you can maybe run it both, right? In positive or negative mode or do polarity switching in the same run. But yeah, you should be aware um, what is like kind of like observable with like the technique you use. Um, typically uh, we use a lot of positive mode. 
And that has not only to do with like that um, a lot of compounds we are interested in have like nitrogens, but also has a very practical reason that like the library knowledge is mainly acquired in positive mode. So there I think negative mode is, yeah, I can't tell you like a precise number, but in the GMPS library, for example, most of the annotations are um, in positive mode. So now that's a, so <laughs> very interesting information. I've seen that when you have a, a, a spectral match and you run your samples in, in positive mode and that match comes from a negative mode, um, hit, then that is a sign that that might not be correct. Right? So there, I think being aware um, what, what, what you did and what others did to acquire this data that may end up in like the, the spectral library is really important. And yeah, so now we could go through here and look at like these different compounds and then you could uh, tell me what um, uh, flies well and not well. If you have doubts that something you may want to discuss later with some people in the audience or with us, I'd be happy to talk chemistry. But yeah, so now looking at like a spectra and um, especially looking at spectra of like a, um, a big molecules, like here, like this protein, um, you will see, and I see that often you not only have uh, one functional group that you can protonate or deprotonate, but if you have a protein with like many lysine residues, for example, there might be like multiple primary amines, right? And you can like get a lot of proteins on it. And that is exactly the point when we have to think back about like the M over Z, right? So we measure mass per charge because that dictates what the actual like value will be that you like measure here. And if you have like five times charged uh, compounds from a peptide, for example, then you will actually not see, let's say if it's like uh, 10 kilo Dalton, so 10,000 um, Dalton, then you will not measure this as at 10,000, but like 10,000 divided by five. Right? So it would only be measured as 2,000, which is really convenient because that way we bring actually proteins and like the kind of like observable mass range of our, um, of our mass analyzers. Uh, but yeah, you of course have to know that otherwise there might be confusion. And then metabolomics, obviously we do not deal with like 10 kilodalton compounds so often, but like doubly charged species are, are quite common. And depending on the compound class, you know, like this is um, something one, one has to be Aware of. There will be like some tick marks and MZ mine. You, you can tick to like set the maximum number of like potential charges. But I think also just knowing like why that is is really important. So yeah, especially if you starting with this mass spec, that is something really important to to keep in mind. And then yeah, depending on how big that molecule is, you know, the distributions of charges become become like really like kind of like Gaussian, and you can put like forty protons or so. On, on one protein, right? And then, yeah, you would need to deconvolute, but that's um, something for today, uh, for another day. Okay, so now talking about characteristics and maybe that goes a little bit towards the question we had like in the morning about like what can like the different like mass specs do? So there is, yeah, like a couple of, um, I would say like general like performance uh, uh, values, like here this different skills of like the, my Pokemon card deck. I used to play with, um, such as like resolution and accuracy, sensitivity, um, and very important linearity of the detector. So that's like the dynamic range where you still get like a linear signal response uh, and also very important scan speed. And especially using things like MSMS based uh, molecular networking, that scan speed aspect is quite like essential also for then like proper um, chromatogram building for like feature finding and so on. Because if you have a very slow machine, but the highest resolution, but you just get like, I don't know, um, one scan every 10 seconds or so, well, good luck uh, finding a lot of molecules there. But I think that exactly like looking at FTICR or so, something like that, that have like insane resolutions of 10 million or something that it's not really like, um, um, like useful for, for LCMS MS based. Metabolomics. Fortunately, uh, now we're more like in the range of like 10 hertz plus. I don't know what Tim stuff scans at, but it's probably even higher than 100 hertz. So 100 scans per second. So you get like really a lot of like information. With that, yeah, like um, obviously file size increases, and now files might be up to like a gigabyte or something like that. So yeah, and then last but not least, uh, perhaps like the more on the PI level here, that's interesting. Like they also have very different prices. So 
I don't know, like getting the Cymax uh, FTICR might be a little bit more costly than getting the, I don't know, like a Shimatsu uh, single quad, right? Obviously you can do different things with them. It's actually funny when you calculate then the cost to like the number of scans, then those prices might not be that different anymore. Maybe like a more expensive machine will provide you much faster um, useful data than you would need to like scan uh, with like a cheaper but less performing instrument. So maybe, especially if you like have a 24 seven running core facility, those might be important um, things to think about. But yeah, like just to give you like a, an idea what resolution uh, actually is. So this is basically like the, the half width at which you can like resolve like a mass peak. And here, so this is also, I think some, um, some peptide um, data. So this is an isotope pattern actually, uh, which is quite important to resolve the charge state because you can measure that um, difference here. And it should be like uh, something like one divided by Z, right? Because one would be the mass difference of like the 12C to the 13C isotope. And then obviously if you have higher charges then this difference becomes smaller. So if you can resolve this and like measure this, um, difference very uh, precisely, you know already what the charge state is. So, so about proteins, this is, this is really important. Anyway, main take home message here is that at different resolutions, we either get like here a nice baseline separation or not, right? Like, okay, 18,000, that would be within like the performance range of like a, a QTOF typically. Um, maybe it was like the higher performing QTOFs, now you can go up to like, I don't know, 80,000 or something, but then with like orbit traps, you can like even go higher, right? And that makes quite um, a difference to get like such isotope resolution or also like mass accuracy, right? So here you see with like changing resolution, we also get like a different like error basically given in PPM. So this is parts uh, per million. Question. Yeah, so this really depends with what type of orbit trap. So now we have a QEHF, uh, which has like the high field orbit trap, so that scans faster. So now I use higher resolutions than I would do during my postdoc where we had the classic. Um, and it also like depends on gradient length and complexity of samples. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But typically now it's like for MS1, 70K, 70,000, and then MS2, I run at the lowest resolution because I want to get a lot of MS2s within the duty cycle that should be below a second typically as a rule of thumb. Now, if I expand like the gradient to like, I don't know, 60 minute gradient, which we use for top down mass spec, then um, I typically use like 240,000 full resolution. But that also, I need that in order to get like um, uh, isotope resolution for like the bigger proteins. But it's a very different uh, question. Now, looking at dissolved organic matter, which is kind of my uh, favorite sample matrix because it's ultra complex. We also really need high resolution because there are so many co-eluding features and isobars, right? So like we try to like pull them apart as much as we can on MS1 level. But then yeah, 240 kind of like for like 10 minute gradients or so is, is pushing it. If you want to do DDA, then it's, it's almost like the transient time is too long. So you get not enough data points. Um, I'll, I will make an example drawing later to like get a little bit in the, in the details there. Um, but yeah, so that is resolution. And then, yeah, just like as an example, we have like two compounds here that uh, have very similar masses and then at different resolutions, you know, um, we can then like separate them from each other. And this is not chromatography, this is mass, right? So here, yeah, like a uh, hundred thousand uh, did nicely the trick, then we have like good baseline um, separation of those. So obviously if this would be an environmental sample and now you have many of this uh, almost uh, um, the same mass compounds, then you're like pumping up the, the resolution helps a lot. Okay, so then yeah, to also give you a nice illustrative example. So that would be a typical um, peak shape of like a, a quadrupole analyzer with like 1300 resolution. So this is what we call unit resolution because you kind of know, okay, this is uh, 301 or in this case, 583. And then the isotope peak is 539, right? But then if you compare this like to an FTICR, 
spectra here is, 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 is very different, right? And it's both profile mode, so see it's supposed to be like some, so, some sort of like Gaussian shape. Um, anyway, so yeah, this is a, a, a big characteristic. Okay, and then yeah, for like different molecules and different separation problems, you need different resolutions. Okay, but now talking a little bit about the uh, um, basics behind this, this mass separations. Right, so there's like a bunch of different uh, detectors or like different mass analyzers. So I named already three now, Orbitrap, uh, FTICR and, and uh, TOF, time of flight. Uh, but maybe let's, let's step uh, a little bit back and, and look at like the very first analyzers, which were um, like such sector field mass specs. And I think in some labs, they're still around for like very particular um, applications such as like isotope ratio mass spectrometry. But yeah, like the, the reason why I find them very nice uh, is because I think the, the principle is, is very intuitive, right? So you basically have like this either electrostatic field here or like a magnetic field. And depending on the mass of, a, of an ion that you will shoot in there, you know, it will either be uh, too small, so it get bent too much, like here, like to like the uh, negative um, electrode, right? And discharges there, or it's too heavy, so then it has too much momentum and like kind of like crashes through and, and collides at the positive one, or it just has the right mass and it just like makes its way through, right? And then the same would apply for like the magnetic field part. And that way you can, and that's how I think the first mass spec experiments were actually done. You can like kind of scan through like a mass range depending on like that field strength. And I think kind of like most mass specs use like similar concepts, right? So you need to have like some like physical uh, property that you make yourself um, to use to like either like scan through like a mass range or to like separate them somehow. And yeah, like one very common uh, mass analyzer or like mass filter is like the quadruple. In that sense, right? So, like, I think most of your instruments uh, have them because, in order to do MSMS, you will need to like first isolate um, some of like those ions in order to do like the MSMS step. And yeah, typically, this is a quadrupole. And yeah, as the name said, you have like uh, four rods or so quadrupoles. And the thing here is not that you like ramp like the field strengths, but you actually um, like switch like the polarity between the two, right? And like now similar as in the sector field, like you have to think about it, okay, there's like some of those rods are like positively charged and some negatively charged. And obviously if you have now a positively charged ion flying into like that rod, then it will be attracted by like the, you know, like negative rod in that situation. So now it will fly towards like that rod. And then if you don't do anything, it was just like fly and get discharged, right? So nothing one, but like if we now switch, like that polarity, you know, then maybe just before it reaches there, um, then it gets like switched and then it gets expelled again. So it will like now go like to the, towards the next one. But then if you um, switch this again, you know, then it will be attracted there. And then hopefully it will never actually get discharged at um, some of those rods, but rather like fly through and reach like the end of like this quadruple analyzer. So, now I only drew it here like in, in 2D, but you have to kind of like think about this, like doing like a type of like spiraling thing through like the rods, right? So now the funny or like the important thing is that like um, the frequency of like the switching, like the RF radio frequency here is kind of like what dictates whether like a molecule like makes its way through or not, depending on its mass, right? Because like if you have, let's say a lighter um, ion, you know, then it might get like um, more quickly, like, um, you know, like affected by this, by this polarity switch, where it's like, when it's like heavier, then it has like just more monumentum, you know, and it might take like, a little bit longer. So there's kind of like um, a very illustrative example I, I heard about. It's like when you think about like a big boat and a small boat trying like to like drive through like a very thin like harbor entry, right? And then like, I don't know, if, like, one person guides them through and like they tell like the quick boat, uh, go left, go right, go left, go right, right? They may um, do not like make a big change, but like <laughs> the big 
<laughs> ship, you know, if they say at a very high frequency, like go, go left, right, it doesn't make any effect and it just goes straight into like the wall. Um, yeah, we could draw that later as a fun exercise during the, uh, during the heavy hour. But anyway, I, I hope you, you kind of uh, get the point of like the, the quadrupole uh, mass analyzer. So now if I want to create like a spectrum, right, all I need to do, I need to ramp through like this RF. And that is what a scanning quadrupole does, right? So like you kind of like change um, like this uh, switching speed, so the frequency, um, and then get like for every speed kind of like a signal whether some molecules make it through or not. That's not very sensitive because you lose a lot of ions because they all get discharged and only you see the ions at a given time that make its way through. Hence like the sensitivity of a quadrupole in scanning mode is not, not so great. But once you set it to like a single frequency and only let a particular ion species go through, then it becomes very sensitive. This is why when you do targeted analysis in MRM, so multi-reaction monitoring, you will set the um, quadrupoles of your triple quad to like specific like frequencies and then only let go through like a certain precursor and a certain like product. And then that's probably like the most sensitive option you have for like metabolomics with absolutely great um, dynamic range. So yeah, those of you who do targeted analysis, you probably have a, have a triple quad. Um, now for us doing non-targeted, we kind of like um, also set it only to one mass. And that is the mass of like the precursor that we wanna get like the MSMS data from. So also there it's relatively like sensitive, um, but we're not using it in a, in a scanning mode. All right, so yeah, those are different forms of like quadrupoles. So you can have it here like in this linear thing, but then there's also like this 3D, um, quadrupole, so that's known as a, as an ion trap. Some instruments may, may have that um, in your lab. All right, then let's go from like the uh, quadrupole to like the next step, like a TOF. Right, so this is, I think, uh, instrument types um, a lot of you have. And I think also here, it's very intuitive. It's actually great um, to like explain mass spectrometry because like the principle is super simple. So you just like take all molecules in your sample or in a given time of, of your LC gradient. And then you just like accelerate them all with the same kinetic energy and let them fly through a, a field-free drift tube. And then simply depending on their mass, you, you know, all give, give them all the same push, they will arrive at different times, the detector. Hence, tough uh, time of flight, uh, relatively uh, straightforward. And then, yeah, like you measure this time that corresponds to M over Z. And then how, depending on how many ions collide to your detector at a given time, you get a signal and then you get like um, this mass spectrum. Okay, so yeah, this is a, um, a Kruger impact. Uh, actually, one of the labs we, we have that's available here is pretty interesting, um, um, a nice uh, instrument. And yeah, when you look at like the, the ion path here, you see the ESI source at the left. Um, then yeah, there's some optics or so ion funnel and then there's a quadrupole, what I showed you for like um, separating certain precursors. Then there's a collision cell where you can let them fragment. And then yeah, here, like this big tube, that's why the top is like that, uh, like kind of long um, tube type of thing is like the field free drift tube. And then it also, so this would be a reflectron because it has like this iron mirror at the top and you basically double the, um, the top uh, pathway and also refocus um, some of the ions, which will increase the resolution. All right, so now, yeah, combining the two things, right? So now let's think about we have a quadrupole time of flight mass spec, so QTOF. What we would do now here, we would just set the frequency of like that um, RF uh, of our quadrupole to like a fixed value that let's say uh, will result in a stable trajectory for like MZ300. You know, that way I isolate now here, like this green ion that goes through, all the rest gets discharged at the rods. Then it flies into like the collision cell. Uh, we hit it with like the neutral collision gas, it fragments, and then it comes to the top. And then we measure the flight times of these fragments, which then would result in our MSM. All right. Okay. How do we um, now get the intensity there? So that was. Again, like the detector part at the, at the beginning of this drawing. So there we typically use like electron multipliers 
think those are very typical in, in iron traps and, um, and uh, trouble quads or so. And then um, for like the TOFs, I think there's often like plate detectors that are used. And the idea is in both that basically it hits to like a, a certain surface and then like um, let's free a couple of like electrons and they hit either the other side of like that um, electron multiplier or here the next stage of like this plate detector and then yeah, multiply the electrons till we can actually measure enough current as a, as a signal. All right. So now talking about uh, FTNS. So that stands for Fourier transform. So here I think both like the quadrupole and the TOF kind of like uh, separating ions and then detecting them by letting them collide against the detector. Right? But now in FTMS, it's a little bit different because we don't let them collide, but we are actually measuring induced current by letting them circle around like the ion trap. And then yeah, you have kind of like uh, plate detectors on the side. And then when they fly by, they induce like a current, like you would expect from your bicycle um, generator to make, I don't know if some of you still had one of those. I, I had one. Turns and then yeah, it, make, it makes good. So yeah, okay, I, I'm afraid. Okay, here we have a pretty cool 21 Tesla. I don't know if that's in Florida or PNNL, but yeah, that's one of like the biggest mass specs um, I think around, it's pretty expensive. It has the super uh, high field strengths, pretty um, expensive both to buy and to maintain due to the helium cost. Um, anyway, what happens in there, luckily now the video works, is again that we have like this uh, electrospray um, ionization, right? So like here you see like the droplets become small and then actually I think here it's the yeah, like ion evaporation models, so like single ions evaporate out of this droplet. Anyway, at the end you have single um, ions. Then they come into like here, like the optics, then they're stored in a, in a trap, and then they're like transferred into the ICR cell. And now the interesting thing is now you like basically let them accelerate by like applying again, like an RF between like this, uh, uh, yeah, quadrupoles here. And now they've kind of like find their like certain like um, stable trajectory in there. And now when you stop um, like accelerating them, they will fall back to their kind of like natural uh, trajectory given from like the magnetic field. And while you like basically now wait and let them fall back, you measure basically the um, here frequency by which they like pass this detectors. And then you get like this complicated signal. And then with Fourier transformation, you can um, yeah, like kind of transform this to like actually a mass spectrum. And that is, I think, very like different to the concept of you know, separating things and then letting them collide. Right? So now also here you can like do this repeatedly, or you can do this for like longer time. And depending on this transient time, you can modulate the resolution of the machine. And well, the Arbitrab is, is different, but like it, it works kind of like in a, in a similar fashion, just that you do not have um, a magnetic field, but an electrostatic field. And also you have a central electrode to let it like circle around. So yeah, I guess some of you have this machine in the lab. So it's the tribrid, uh, kind of like the high-end version of the Arbitrab. And yeah, like instead of now this ICR cell, you have like here, like the central like Arbitrab electrode and now like, yeah, here what happens is when you inject the ions, they're basically orbiting like around like the central electrode. And now depending on the movement on the Z axis, which you can measure with like the plate detectors again, um, you will have like different mass dependent, um, yeah, like speeds of, of, of movement there with, again, with like FT, um, so Fourier transformation, you can then uh, convert into a, a mass spectrum. So yeah, this is how like here this tribrid is built up. So again, we have like the ESI here on the bottom left, then some like electron optics, then a quadrupole, right? To like isolate precursors. And then you have like this Z-trap here, which is needed to like accumulate ions and then push them into like uh, one bunch into like the um, Orbitrap to start like the, the, the mass scan. And then yeah, like here the Orbitrap. And then this thing is, has like a couple of extra toys. So you also have a linear ion trap at the end. So this is particularly important when you want to do like MSN. 
I don't think we're gonna go too much into detail, but like kind of like the principle I showed you um, earlier that you like isolate ions, fragment them, and then read out, you can also do with n steps. So that would be MSN, right? So you can do like separation, fragmentation, but then you separate again one specific ion of those and then fragment it and then do it again. And, you know, that way you can build fragmentation trees, which I think has quite some interesting aspects for um, de novo structure. Um, elucidation or like understanding of fragmentation behavior. I think Corinna in the audience uh, has some cool stuff going on with that. If you want to talk to her um, later, I'm sure she would be delighted to tell you about her project. Anyway, um, yeah, like again, that movement along the Z axis. So that would be like here, like the central electrode, you know, this is mass dependent. And while I don't fully understand the math and the physics, behind it either. I think this is the main take home message here, depending on how fast they move like up and down, you know, you get a different frequency um, and then they have obviously a different mass. So this is very accurate, almost as accurate as FTICR, but yeah. Exactly, yeah. So then that's why like the scan time is really dependent on at what resolution you measure. It's interesting because that is, um, you can't really modulate that so much on the top, right? But here you just like pump up the uh, transient time and then you get higher resolution. And that's an interesting marketing strategy from Termo because they limit that in the software. So you may have heard about like the Explorers series that you can buy with like 120,000, 240,000 and, and 480,000 resolution. So, I mean, there, there might be like some hardware differences too, but the reason why you cannot like measure at 480,000 with like the simple version is that it simply does not allow you to like increase that transient. <laughs> uh, also there is, I think a 1 million resolution option for like the tribrid. So that basically just uh, um, activates the longer transient times and then you can measure at 1 million, but you may have to pay a couple of, I don't know, <laughs> 10 or like 100,000 euros. I don't know what, what it is, but yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. <laughs> Do you think that's true? I mean, if you buy the 1 million option, they don't switch to arbitrage for you. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's a that software update. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I think this is the important concept for like the mass dependent uh, thing here. And then, yeah, again, you like get like this interferogram and then you do Fourier transform and you get the mass spectrum. So now going like one step back to like this Z trap um, that is required to inject the ions into the Orbi trap. There's a, um, an important thing about this. And I think again, when you like set up your methods and, and we will wanna actually set up a method later here, right? Um, this is an important thing to know and this is the automated gain control. So um, depending on how long you keep the C trap open, you can accumulate a lot of ions that you inject for one mass spec experiment into like the orbit trap, right? And there is one particular buzzword and that is called the space charge effect that you wanna um, avoid. Let's see if I can remove that here. Yeah, so space charge effect is bad because that is like the effect when um, too many ions are kind of like inside of the trap and then they, are all in positive mode, positively charged, right? So, and then they would start expelling each other. And I think this is very well visualized in the uh, Three Stooges syndrome. And I really hope that this video works because um, yeah, I think that explains it very well. I don't know if, if some of you remember this series, but yeah, this is basically like the different ions we have, you know, this is caffeine and then another thing is cocaine and whatever. And if you like try to like bring them all in at the same time, you know, they're kind of like expelling each other. And well, it's not like it's as traumatic as here, um, but uh, what you will actually notice is if you like overload your ion trap here or the orbit trap with um, 
uh, with too many ions, your resolution will go down. So that's why if you measure like at really high mass accuracy, you typically lower the AGC you know, to, in order to get less space charge effect and, and more clean peaks. Whereas if you want to really have a high dynamic range, so you're kind of like interested in many things there, then you typically bump up your AGC. And you can do this wrong, right? You can like make, put like some crazy values in there and then you wonder why your sensitivity is so bad. Yeah, because you kind of like close the gate uh, too, too early of like the C-trap. So yeah, in a sense, uh, you have to think about it as like a balancer, you know, letting ions in or not, right? And then there's kind of like two values that is important for us to set. That's uh, first of all, the total number of ions. So this would be the AGC target. And then there's also, and I don't know if there's some analogy to like some local clubs here, but there's also like a time, you know, when they say, all right, now I waited long enough, let's close the door and let's uh, send this ions on their right, right? Because otherwise your scan time like goes like uh, down quickly. And yeah, these two values we typically set in the method. So there's, well, like your default value might be a good start, but you might want to uh, tailor this both to your chromatography as well as the type of like experiment you, you want to do. All right, uh, okay, there's single ion charge detection. I think I'm gonna skip that. That's a really cool new thing that you can actually detect uh, single molecules in an orbit trap. Um, it's particularly useful for um, uh, like native mass spectrometry, which is uh, a thing we're kind of interested. And in. if you're interested in that, let me know. We can chat about it later, but I think for now it's a little bit too much. Um, so, yeah. okay, so now we know the basics about mass spectrometry. Are there any questions so far? Okay, it's all clear. Awesome. Um, okay, so now how are we gonna uh, couple uh, chromatography and, and, and mass spectrometry and how can we use MSMS here? So again, we have ESI, right? So this is, we're already in the liquid phase. So for liquid chromatography, this is great. And then, yeah, we wanna couple it uh, to the uh, thing. And again, like a reminder from the Simpsons, um, there's actually a mention of like chromatography when they uh, try to like identify the secret component of um, uh, the flaming mole. So yeah, here, this is a gas chromatographer, chromatography. And according to uh, the machine, the secret ingredient was love. Uh, I don't know, it's a funny thing, but it's, yeah, chromatography, super important, right? So I guess it's all of you have, have worked with it, like um, most of you know what it is. So yeah, to like also go back to like the very basic concepts, it's, it's simply like the interaction with like molecules with like a stationary phase, right? So here in paper chromatography, you may have done that in, I don't know, Someone in, in middle school or high school already, you know, you can like see like this different drift times um, of like this uh, dyes in like regular paper, right? And then, yeah, if you put this into like a liquid, like solvent typically, you will see this different migration times here. And then also if you are more on the organic chemistry side, you know, like doing like this liquid liquid extractions, it's also kind of like chromatography, right? So you simply um, separate molecules depending on whether they, um, dissolve better like in an aquatic phase or like in the um, organic phase, right? And now, okay, here it's liquid, liquid, but if one of the phases is like uh, solid, you know, or gaseous, then you could have different types of like chromatography. So now we typically use columns. So then, yeah, now, well, you have to think about, okay, one of these phases would be actually like the, the, the beads inside of that column. So, and then you have like liquid running through you know, and now depending on how strong the molecules interact with like the stationary phase, they will come out at the end at different times, right? And that is uh, all the secret about chromatography. Now we can have different like um, phases. Obviously we can separate uh, based on like polarity um, through polar interactions, then non-polar interactions. Uh, that is probably like the most common thing for most of you, like uh, C18. So reversed phase, but then as Martin showed, you can also do like uh, ion chromatography where you actually have ion, -ion binding um, or for like gas chromatography boiling point. So there you have like one thing in the gas phase. Um, 
or size exclusion or also like certain affinities. So that for like protein um, separation might become very important when you put actually like a his tag at the end of your protein and then separate it by its affinity to like some nickel ions, right? So there's many different types. Um, again, like, yeah, probably most important is reverse phase. So here we have like this longer chains, uh, typically C18. I think in that case, it would be C5. I don't know if that actually exists, but um, I think that the concept is the same. So you have like this, this chain. And then if you have like um, nonpolar interactions through like van der Waals um, forces, you know, then like the nonpolar stuff sticks more in it. And like here, that molecule that actually has a, hydroxy group at the top, you know, that likes it better and like the more polar, like mobile phase, hence it goes through quickly. Okay, so there's a lot of like different chain lengths and like different like functionalizations with like phenyl group. Sometimes they put like a polar group in the middle or on the side. So these are like the, the secrets of like the different um, vendors again, and they all promise you that they their column work, work the best. Anyway, hopefully you will get some sort of like, you know, chromatogram that has a nice Gaussian shape. And just to give you like an idea, yeah, so here again, you can calculate resolution, stuff like that, but I don't wanna bore you with that. Like, so that would be a typical uh, chrom chromatogram we observe like on our machine with like a C18 column and you have like this nice sharp peaks, um, typically like a little bit of tailing. So that's something we, we struggle with, but so it's not perfect Gaussian, but I think just like by the half width, it's it's pretty um, it's pretty good. Okay, so now yeah, we can obviously detect these molecules when they come out of the column. Um, okay, I'm gonna spoil at the end. We're gonna use some aspect, but there's also other detectors like uh, UV um, um, spectroscopy, fluorescence, or like light scattering, and so on. But yeah, mass spectrometry is for us today the tool of choice. Okay, and then, yeah, what you will end up with is kind of like you have a separation first by the um, chromatography. Then you can like isolate certain like um, molecules in the quadrupole, fragment them, and then they go into the obby trap or into TOF or whatever instrument you have. And at the end, you get an MS MS spectrum. So now, okay, let's watch this um, again. Let's see, okay, so we have the stuff go through and get like this readout. So now the quadrupole would be set and bypass. Um, we would actually not fragment it, but we would just get like an MS1 scan. Okay. So yeah, this is the machine in our lab. If you want later at the end of session two, who's interested and who's not seen one, I can like show you around and, and we can like take a look at it uh, in real life. If you have one in your own lab, I don't want to bore you with looking at another um, instrument. But yeah, so for the rest of the workshop, what is important is that we kind of like think a little bit about like the data frame that we will get out, right? And that is like here, this like three dimensional data structure. So we have mass or M over Z on this one axis, then retention time, and then intensity to the top, right? And now with MS-MS, obviously it gets like a little bit more complicated because now we have also this additional MS-MS dimension, which is hard to visualize here in our 3D world. And yeah, again, because this is really the, I think, important um, aspect of it. So we separate ions with that quadrupole, right? And then fragment them and then get a second MS-MS spectrum, or like actually the MS-MS spectrum um, from these fragments, right? And that is kind of what helps us identify the molecule. Fortunately, this would, you know, if this belongs to like the moic acid or so, would explain somehow like the structure because it typically fragments at certain like positions in the molecule. And I totally make, made this up so don't Judge me about breaking CC uh, bonds here. Um, but yeah, I think you hopefully get the point. So now what I just showed you would be a product ion scan, right? So we would scan for like the product ions of like this MS MS fragmentation. But just to uh, be a little bit uh, more complete, there's obviously many different ways in which you can run an MS MS experiment. And particularly if you have a, a triple quad, 
you know, you can scan either with one quad or the other. And that would allow you to not only scan for like certain fragments, for example, or like for like the full fragment spectrum, but it would also allow you to actually scan for all precursors that result in a certain fragment, right? So that would be then like a precursor ion scan. So here, okay, this was, um, yeah. We would scan with like uh, MS1 and would fix the MS2 here to like a certain value. So we would only like basically get a signal if any molecule here at a given time would result like here, like in this green um, spectrum, for example. So MS1 scans, MS2 is fixed. Okay, and that's how it would look like. See, like the red one did not result in the desired fragment, but actually the blue one and the green one did. So now I know both blue and green one have a certain fragment. And now if I have already an idea about a substructure, let's say I'm interested in residues with like this fluorinated thing in my environmental data, then I could like now figure out, okay, what's the actual mass of these fragments and then set the machine up and now detect all putative precursors that contain this functional group. So that's really interesting because the QTOF and the Q orbitrap, they cannot do that. Uh, why am I telling you about it? Because there are some new tools actually like on the bioinformatics side downstream to let us design an experiment like that in our data analysis. And that's MassQL, which Ming will highlight on, on Thursday. But just again, like to keep in mind, there's many different MSMS experiments you, you can do. Okay, there's multi-reaction monitoring. I, measured, I mentioned that at the beginning. So this would be the typical instrument um, experiment for like targeted analysis. So here I would fix now both MS1 and MS2 to like a certain MZ value. And then, um, you know, would only let through, let's say compound with the mass 304 that I know is cocaine. And then I know it makes like a certain fragment, which is, I don't know, 204. And then I only let that through like with the second uh, um, quadruple here. And that really like increases like dynamic range and sensitivity of the, of the experiment. So that's again, why for targeted analysis, this is typically the experiment of choice. So how would, how would that look? So here, if you see, you know, I filter basically everything out that does not fulfill my MS1 requirement. And then I only let through like the fragments. So I kind of have two levels of like um, selectivity. here. So now how are the odds that at unit resolution, there's like many molecules that have the same mass pretty high. How are the odds that like there's many molecules with the same mass that also produce like the same fragment and have the same retention time? Well, not, not so high. So yeah, this is, I think the thing. And yeah, like if you like look at um, like an experiment here, single ion monitoring. So this would be where I only look at MS1 level for like certain things with, a, with the mass 821. In this example, you know, I would get like a couple of peaks. I can't get them separated by uh, chromatography. But then when I go now to this MSMS step in MRM, then I get like a nice single peak. All right, and now <laughs> to like make it complete neutral loss scan. Who of you has used neutral loss? Okay, cool, some people, awesome. So here, this is probably like the most confusing one because you work with a certain offset of MZ value. Right, and that means that you scan with your MS1 and, and MS2 um, like at the same time, but you just have them with a certain offset scanning. And that offset is exactly matching to like a certain neutral loss you um, expect. So let's say um, here in this example, I think it's water, right? There's like this water molecules. I wanna find uh, molecules that um, yeah, basically lose uh, water um, in their fragmentation. So now I simply scan with MS1 and at the same time scan with MS2 with like 18 M over Z offset, right? And if I do that, then only things that actually produce um, like this loss of like 18 will like make its way through. That's also, you cannot do that with the QTOF platform, but with MassQL, you can write queries that you can look in your non-targeted MSMS data. So from actually product, um, ion scan data for certain fragment patterns that fulfill that requirement. So that's a cool new thing. Um, anyway, okay, so now we learned a little bit about 
um, like the different scan modi. And again, like the most important one for us is like the product line scan. So that's what I showed you twice now. So here we basically set MS1 to like a fixed mass, right? And then only, um, well, only let those through, fragment them, and then scan for like all the fragments. So that's how it will look, right? So we only let the green one through and then get like all like the fragment ions from this particular precursor. All right, and then as an example here, rapamycin, a very important natural product, you know, at MS1 level, we would see here, well, there's like this couple of uh, molecules. We don't really get isotope resolution. So it's probably not the greatest um, mass spec experiment. Uh, there's also um, here some delta masses of five, which uh, I think would be the difference between sodium and ammonia anyway. Um, so we don't know what addict it is exactly, but yeah, that's what we, what we get. And now if we set our MS1 to like here, 821 and then produce like fragment ions, you know, then we would get this product ion spectrum um, with like the significant um, pattern here. Okay. So now I can do this, of course, with things I know, but how do I do this for like things I don't know, right? So how do I know to what masses I should set up the instrument before my run? Because I don't know what, uh, how many hundreds or thousands of different molecules there are and at what like particular times they come down of like the HPLC column. So that's really, Another super important thing, and that is that we, we run the machine in a somewhat smart way that is called data dependent acquisition. So we basically acquire MSMS dependent on the data that comes from the machine in real time. And you have to think it, about it like in a way that we kind of like cycle through uh, so-called like duty cycles. And I, I mentioned that term earlier because really like the time of uh, such a duty cycle is, is important for like um, data quality, but the idea behind that is that I simply do MS1 experiment and then consecutive MS2 experiment. And on the fly, the machine decides, what did I observe in this MS1 scan? Okay, then a split second later, I isolate exactly like the most abundant ions from this um, survey scan and then get MSMS uh, information from it. So yeah, now we kind of like can think about it. Okay, we cycle through, right? So with every new cycle, we then know, okay, what's there at the time? Let's get this and this and this fragment. Now, in order to not do this over and over again, once like a certain mass is like fragmented, we put them on an exclusion list. Um, so it does not get fragmented over and over again, but we wanna like kind of like, you know, walk a little bit down the, the spectral tree of like all like these different molecules and cover as many as we can. And these settings for dynamic exclusion are like really important. And if you do molecular networking or any MS2 based stuff for your ID and you do not use that, then your coverage will be like relatively small. And like looking at like public data out there, I, I'm surprised how often people don't use dynamic exclusion and they just get MS MS uh, scans from like the same precursors over and over again. Um, we can, for fun, like take a look at some when we show the dashboard because there you can see this very nicely. So now, okay, how does that look in real time? So this is just like some regular um, like data we acquire on, on uh, I think there was even an LTQ arbitrage. Anyway, you can see it cycling through like different MSMS events. And yeah, now here scan time coming back to the characteristics is really important because if you only get like one scan per second, you know, like the time to like actually get like enough MSMS is, is really low. And now it becomes really problematic if your chromatography is very sharp, right? Because then you even have only just like a, a very short moment uh, during which like the, the peak comes down, right? So yeah, here, like the scan speed is, is really an important feature, probably just as important as like the, the resolution as at which you measure. All right, I think, um, yeah, I'm gonna show you just like some more data because like I spent a lot of time with this during my PhD. So this would be a typical um, B and Y ion fragmentation uh, series from like a peptide. 
And this is actually peptide with like this unusual like paramino benzoic acid moieties. Um, Tom worked a little bit with that as well, which is like, yeah, like a super potent uh, antibiotic uh, and non-ribosomal uh, uh, peptide produced by uh, some bacteria. So now working with this and like, you know, getting like this MSMS uh, spectrum of this, uh, I also got a lot of other MSMS -MS spec uh, spectra of like, that had similar patterns, right? And just like by, by looking at this and looking at the differences of like this ion series, we could postulate um, other derivatives, right? So like we observe a shift of like one of those and that way we can maybe say, oh, at this end of the molecule, there is a delta of, uh, I don't know, like here, this carbomeryl group. So that could explain then the form. Okay, or here we actually have two modifications, this carbomeryl group and here, like the central like cyanoalanine is actually also uh, modified. So just by MSMS, I can start postulating like new derivatives out of like already a one known. Or for peptides particularly, I can also like postulate a structure de novo by de novo sequencing. So this is really, this is really powerful, but obviously it's hard to do that at scale manually. I think that's, we're gonna show you this week how we may can do that a little bit faster. But just, uh, okay, to wrap up like the first part, um, I was like wondering, uh, what do you think what like level of uh, annotation these different uh, things are I've, I've just shown you? So Martin introduced that earlier. So this is basically like the four levels of the metabolomics uh, community annotation, so not the environmental uh, community. But yeah, like, so we basically have these different levels of certainty. And I think this is another very important take home message for today. But if we like um, identify something based on um, an authentic standard and ideally orthogonal methods, you know, then we should call this identified and provide like the level of evidence. So this would be level one, right? And all the other things here, we would not call them identified, but annotated. And like matching MSMS spectra to like a library, um, which we will probably end up, and that's probably like the highest level of annotation we, we go out in most experiments. That is not like called identified, but like annotated as yeah, like a, a putative metabolite based on like MSMS matching. You, know, you could call it like match to like tryptophan uh, based on like MSMS. Now, what I just showed you would not be even that because that is like even more uh, putative, right? So that's postulated. So here I could probably calculate accurately the, um, the molecular formula based on like the similar MSMS pattern. I can get some sort of like class level annotation, but yeah, that would be level three. And then if I had absolutely no idea what it is, I just measure the mass and get like a, a peak um, on, in my chromatography, then this would be like an unknown level four. So I get like a reproducible mass uh, that I can measure and observe, but I have no idea what it is. Uh, fortunately, we bumped up like these levels to level one because one of my co-workers, um, uh, uh, Leonard von Eckerstein, did all the hard work to total synthesize these molecules based on my suggestions. And fortunately, they, they had the same retention time and um, MSMS fragmentation patterns. So then we really confirmed those as, as level uh, one. But yeah, I think in, in most experiments, you don't have... Um, somebody talented down, down the road who is willing to synthesize molecules for you. So we have to live with like this other levels. Okay, question. So this characterization is basically just based on your testing. And obviously you also know something of your samples. For mm -hmm. instance, if you just use E. coli, you know, basically we already know all the metabolites of E. coli, but we just don't know in all the surfaces. Yeah. So that would Maybe then go uh, higher level, or would you still say no? Then no, it's still annotated. It's, uh, it's yeah, I would say even if you know, like that is from E. coli, and I worked with E. coli, then I would still call this a level two if it's matched to MSMS. And you have some additional evidence, but I would only call it level one if you have the authentic standard and see that it also has the same retention time. And then even then it, there, there might be still like some things we can discuss about, about like stereo uh, chemistry, you know, maybe if you do not have a chiral column, then you may 
cannot even be sure if it's like DOL uh, tryptophan in, in that case, right? So there's quite some uh, caveats. And I, you know, in some non-targeted experiments, particularly when those are like MS1 only, I find it sometimes shocking what like people actually like describe as like annotated, especially working with like, um, you know, model organisms. And they say, yeah, we have like this, this great met uh, metabolic models and we know like everything what's in there and we just like uh, check them off. But like, what are the odds that there are like other molecules that have like almost the same mass or the same mass? What are the odds that they're isomers, right? So um, yeah, I think this is, needs to be clear. And I mean, it's not the end of the world if you do not have more evidence, right? Just like describe it accordingly um, to like either this levels or like the levels Martin showed from, from Emma Shimansky, if you're like in the environmental field and that communicates like the confidence you have. Cool, all right. I think that's all I wanted to show you in part one. Then if there's more questions, I'm happy to answer questions before we go to the break. Yeah. Um, you saw the picture uh, with all the German mass and I've seen pictures like that before where the collision cell is like behind the orbit trip. So it goes back, right? Mm -hmm. Like what's the point of that? Uh, that's the design of the Q executive. Uh, it's actually a good question, uh, which I don't really know why they did it. I think maybe it's an engineering question because they first had the executive that did not have a um, that did not have a quadrupole. Well, I don't know actually, but I if I had to design it, I would have put it before the. Um, so maybe it has to do with like the pressure inside. Um, but yeah, I, I honestly don't don't know. Uh, regarding the uh, related DMS job coverage uh, in the media experiment, maybe you mentioned that a little bit. What's your opinion about using an exclusion list extracted from a blank injection, for example? Because I was discussing it with a guy from Thermo, and in his opinion, um, like when you run a blank injection and then you do like feature detection, uh, I mean, that depends on how to do it. But you end up with like hundreds and even thousands of features yeah. in your exclusion list. So the chance of missing some, sorry, of missing some MS2 uh, of some relevant analytes are quite high compared to the chance of missing uh, of missing MS2 because you're actually fragmenting like background ions. So yeah. you actually said it might be even better not to use an exclusion list from a bank injection. Yeah, I would probably not do it either. So um but also like my background is like more like on the natural product mining side and I'm always worried to miss something because it could be that cool new molecule, right? So I, I don't wanna exclude things there. Obviously, if you have like very clear high abundant contaminants in there, right? let's say, you know, or from like your process plank, there's like this PEC contaminant because you used SUPOR filters that are PEC coded, then maybe it makes sense to put those on the exclusion list because otherwise they will, just like take away so much of like your scan time, right? So, but then like doing a plank uh, injection and subtracting everything that is like even at like the LOD, you know, then I would not, I would not do that. And yeah. Also regarding the um, uh, exclusion list. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the first one is, do you uh, exclude only the, um, the, feature, the the masses that have been selected for MS2, or do you also select for MS2? Uh, no, I think like the, so we're pretty much like bound to like the vendor possibilities there in the acquisition software. And yeah, we exclude, oh, no, actually, I think we do. Um, so, okay. so it only excludes like a certain uh, feature that was triggered for MSMS, right? For a given time. But there, in addition to dynamic exclusion, there is other functions. And I assume you mean isotope patterns yeah. with blood plus one and two, right? In case it's it's single charged, then you can exclude those two. Also, depending on the experiment, you can also say that it should automatically select the monoisotopic peak. And that is particularly important if you work with like peptides, or eventually like molecules that contain 
um, elements which have a very strong isotopic pattern, like halogens or so, because then what you will often have is that not like the smallest peak is the most abundant one, right? But you have actually something like this, but we kind of like wanna have like the mono isotopic peak because it makes like downstream analysis a little bit easier. So there is, yeah, a particular for like the Q-exact that you can, you can check this. I'll show you later in the second part. And then you're like the isotope isolation. Yeah, basically it then expands like the exclusion list to like the full isotope. Also, so different genes for the. Yes. Yeah. So that's another setting. So typically, um, for like yeah, metabolomics experiment, I would exclude features that are like too highly charged, right? Because then I say, okay, that's likely proteins. Um, on the other hand, if I do like proteomics, then I don't want to like single charged um feed or like molecules because they're most likely not triptych peptides because yeah if you do shotgun then you typically have like the end terminus and like the basic amino acid at the at the c terminus so you yeah, typically have two charges so most of your peptides are double charged or more right so then you would exclude single charged species or also things that you uh do not know what charge they have so you can exclude everything that has um not assigned charge state that also helps to like reduce a little bit like noise and um, not wasting too much scan on, on, on trash. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, how big and how far maps, what's the highest and they can be captured and how would that relate to time? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, so in the top, it's technically not limited, right? So you can, I don't know, like measure a couple of hundred thousand, perhaps. So like with Maldi-Tov, that's that's what you observe. Um, it's seldomly that you need that, right? Because you have like this multiple charged species. And when people do like native MS, then they bring in entire viral capsids into like the gas phase, right? And but then they have like hundreds or if not thousands of, of charges um, on it, right? So and then you bring it to the lower MZ range. Uh, but yeah, like TOF, so technically is, is not really limited. Unfortunately, the orbit traps also, uh, I think it's also a software setting, but they just max out it typically, I think in hours at 6,000 6, M over Z. Um, there is an ultra high mass range version that has, again, supposedly some like physical differences, but I think it's mainly like a software difference that, that does allow you to scan to like higher MZ values, which Again, like for a native MS, this is this is quite critical, and it's uh, it's too bad. It's a little bit of limitation for some of the experiments we want to do here. So that's why I uh, often go over to the other lab and use their QTOF. And it's also for natural humanity, you know, like when they have a time molecule break, it's normally that the is decreased. I just wonder like, if that's just real or it can be some artifact to be called ionization or the capture efficiency for those high. And the like ions is also decreasing. Sorry, can you say it again? Uh, so for the natural commander, like normally we'll see the peak intensity like the dramatically reduced when the molecule MZ ratio above thousand or two thousand, something like that, right? Like we are normally observed the whole matter in the range below thousand something. I'm just so curious like whether that's real mm -hmm. or it's because the technical artifacts. Like so either the ionization efficiency of yeah, the yeah. high and the ions is really lower yeah. or the efficiency of the ions is also not high. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would assume it's both, right? So first I would expect that there is some sort of like normal distribution of like the molecular weight, which I mean, well, like our little uh, data exercise with like the bio databases is obviously biased to what has been observed, right? But there we see like this, this um, Gaussian type of like distribution, um, which I would expect also to be there in nature. Um, in terms of abundance, right? Possibilities are of course like way more the bigger you, you get, but I think about on abundance. Um, and then I think on the technical side, for sure there will be, um, there will be biases and that has something to do with ion transmission. So I think like the, you know, like ion funnel or S lens or whatever you have that kind of like brings in the ions from like the ESI into like your mass analyzer, you know, that's, you, you typically tune that to like a certain like number of like standards you have in your tune mix. And then you optimize like RF and like potential 
uh, in like that transfer um, um, electrodes, right? And those are uh, maybe not made for like the really high MZ range, but like rather for like some smaller molecular weight compounds. Hence, like, yeah, especially if you switch between protein analysis and, and small molecules, I think like changing like this tune files um, and tuning it for like the molecules of interest is, is really important. Yeah. Um, one question. Um, how many scans you need to describe a peak? Like, like if you have like a, a chromatogram and how many scans you have actually, yeah. actually tell that's a peak? Five. Five is max? I, I would say five. <laughs> okay. Um, but this is this is would be a, a setting of like minimum data points. <laughs> I see like the MZ mine people just you caught their attention up there. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, like that's what I, as default, use, right? Um, you most likely miss the peak, right? If you have five, then you maybe have to push the peak. Maybe you miss it. We don't know if you actually hit the peak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, it's gonna be, it's gonna be terrible, right? Yeah. So, um, but like with like DDA methods with top five or so, and like one second duty cycle time, that is just, um, I think like a, a typical value that we observe. Mm -hmm. Now, if you would do a top 10 scan, it would might be even worse, right? And like, so we people use methods like that too. Mm -hmm. Now, if you do MS1 only, then of course you get more MS, MS scan. So now that setting, and tomorrow you will you will set this up with Robin and Steffen, uh, you will see that that you know depend depends a little bit on your data. But so for what we have, I typically use five. And ideally, and in the IIN settings, then I also say, okay, I want to have at least two peaks on each side of the of the apex, right. and that's I would say is the is the minimum for me. But I don't know, maybe you use thirteen. Somebody else uses three. Um, I think three should be the absolute minimum. I have to say, like I, I always download some like heavy DA data sets. What people do GPS uh, stuff, and then sometimes. You know, they shorten the length of the gradient, and we can talk about it tomorrow. It's like, then there's like two data points, or maybe, or maybe three data points, and they're like, oh, but I want to do like statistical analysis and this and that and everything. And I'm like, no. You're going to take some stuff, you're going to create some networks, it's going to be nice, you're going to have some like, basic statistics and so on, but it's not going to be like everything, right? Yeah. So that's always a trade off. Uh, yeah. I mean, especially if you do some sort of feature finding. Right? If you do MS2 based only analysis, like classic molecular networking, yeah, then don't worry. Um, but then it might be not like super semi quantitative either. And yeah, that's true. Maybe, okay, I, I wanted to actually draw this later, but let's do it now. So, what is really important, and yeah, thanks for bringing up that question, is to think about like chromatographic like peaks, right? And then like data point distribution there. So if we would have a uh, very beautiful chromatography and like this nice Gaussian uh, chromatographic peak here, right? So this would be RT and the intensity. Yeah, we would observe this peak. And if there is something like that in our sample, then likely it will be that we should detect this with like the algorithms we have. So now, if, like you said, you have like 13 data points, you know? So let's say you scan at like 10 hearts, you get 10 scans per second, right? And like, you have really many, many data points here. Then, you know, the odds that you described this very well with your data is really good. But now if you're greedy and you wanna Get too many MS MS, and then you just go down to I don't know one hertz, right? And then you only you know describe it like this. Then reality in your data would look different because if you now connect the dots, right? Then it would just look like this. Right? That's still like fine, but now if you even go like to a lower scan speed, you may just have you know one here and <laughs> one here and one here, and then, well, that's not even about like noise. You know? So then it's just going through. So here, like the scan speed needs to match the type of chromatography you expect. Okay, can I add on to this? I don't know, this is a water, a water problem again. Like they did something funny called MSD. So then we do MS1 and then we do like 
the whole bunch uh, is like fragmented, and then we get the fragments of the small things which are just at that time. Yeah. And uh, is this something other companies do as well? And uh, mm -hmm. can we work with this uh, data well? Yeah, yeah. So, like a DIA, data independent acquisition, that's an alternative way of like um, getting MS MS data. Um, yes, MSE is kind of a brand name from Waters. Yeah. Call it. MS everything, right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I find quite uh, funny. Anyway, like uh, Sykes calls it SWAT, and then like, EIA on like arbitrary platforms. You can also do this with shifted windows as a SWAT, and like also with like Q exact. Like, so particularly in, in proteomics, this is kind of like even the standard now. So because they get way, way more coverage with that. Um, I would also say here it really depends on the scan, on the scan speed, right? You need to get like enough scans in order to do your um, like deconvolution of like the spectra. And then you would do like some sort of like correlation based method similar to like an identity molecular networking. And if you do not have enough data points, then that might does not work very well. Cool. All right. Another question. question. Regarding this HCC, uh, if you have a, a sample which is really and the matrix is really complex and you have a lot of background but you have much more or less uh, metabolites would you prefer to have uh, a lower HCC to avoid that the the contaminants go through the uh, orbit trap or would you prefer to make it bigger and to have more metabolites yeah that's a good question um let me think for a second about it. So typically in denser samples, I would increase HEC to get more dynamic range, right? Because I expect that there, if there's a lot in there, then the odds are that there's a lot of like big stuff and also smaller stuff. Right? So now if I lower the HEC, then I will kind of like bring everything down and yeah. then the small, low abundant stuff, you know, that will just fall below an OD. So there, yeah, if you have big concentration differences, um, I would suggest to have increased HEC. Okay. But honestly, I would do some tests with it and look at the data and then see. Do you? For example, these contaminants, so we have uh, things with a lot of cocktails, a lot of uh, yeah. things. So we have times in which we have a lot of items. Yeah. Can you, can you avoid them? Uh, sorry? Can you avoid them somehow? <laughs> I want to, but <laughs> because if you have so many contaminants that they're actually the most abundant peaks, then I would say that's just a problem that it's best to address upstream. Yeah, we do. Uh, so in comparison with our that's one thing like HC targets actually now like in sense, right? Before it was like E5, whatever. Depends on the platform. The key exact is it's it's IN number. Oh, Think okay. on the IDX, it's just an Oh, uh, okay. Because at least uh, the IDX, like one of the newer example mix ones, uh, it's like percentage now. And I thought it was actually quite nice because it's like, okay, like 100% full. You know, it's like, okay, like trap is 100% full. And that just means like one like nine number, right? Um, but that kind of explains how you should think about the trash. And if there's a lot of trash coming in and it's already like 99% full of trash, then you only have like 1% uh, highest that you can measure with your actually. So, and if you then lower the HC, it's even less uh, good signals that you can measure. Cool. All right, let's move on. Okay, one, one more question. Uh, you mentioned about the double charts or multiple charts. Um, we have some peptides, for example, that gives us both double charts and single, uh, single charts. And uh, we want to move this, uh, to shift this uh, balance towards the single, single charts. Mm -hmm. And this is why, because then we can identify uh, more easily. Yeah. Are there any incentives other than yeah. playing with the uh, I would... parameters at random like we do right now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can modulate the pH of your mobile face. Right? 
then if you like increase like the uh, if you increase pH, then you would will get less protonation. So that probably would be a straightforward thing to do. If you can, what would you use as modifier? It will change some things. Uh, we, we, we like not to change anything in the chromatography. Yeah. Uh, but because you can use a makeup flow and then increase the pH. Yes, maybe this way. And uh, then, other than that, you can like increase like the S lens um, uh, RF for if, if it's an arbitrary platform that shifts space. Oh no, you have to decrease it. So it shifts it more to like uh, better conditions for like the lower MZ range. So you maybe was like, I don't know, what, what platform do you have? Uh, okay. I don't know what that would be for the Pruker, but probably it's at some something at the IM tunnel, like the entrance potential or something like that. Uh, so, some Pruker specialist here and can correct me on that. How's it called? Um, <laughs> this uh, um, uh, S lens RF analog for like the Pruker. So it must be the entrance potential at the iron funnel. <laughs> I mean, there's so many, honestly, like, I always feel like uh, demos kind of playing like softball. Like, it's like, yeah, you need one, like, one parameter. And then Bruca is always like, oh, we give you like all the parameters. And it's like 20, and it's like 20 different uh, voltages and, and things that you can like set up. And it's like where the lines are being pushed into the funnel and, and like multiple things. So, at least I feel it's not that straightforward. Like, it's not like, oh, there's one parameter that I can match to. Yeah, sorry, I can't like tell you exactly what to do, but maybe talk to the um, sales rep and ask if there's like any, I don't know, some instruments call it also the clustering potential also. So basically the voltage at the first lens when the stuff comes in. Um, and then yeah, pH, I think that would be probably most effective. Yeah. Maybe we try with the pH. Cool. All right, let's, let's do a quick break before we move on.